Anudas. Okay, so it's a little bit earlier than 10.05 um, Central, Central Standard bit? Time. Uh, I think it's I think it's okay. It's just you know five minutes and we've had about you know fifteen minute break, so I think it's good. Um, so yeah, next up we have uh, Manuel Mago, who's got an excellent talk on uh, language processing. So yeah, take it away. Hi. So. <laughs> Uh, please let me know if uh, there is some no some extra noise, or if if you have difficulties difficulties for understand me. Um, I got some some technical problems, but well, um, I hope everything goes fine. Ca can you see also my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Well, um, well, um, so um, as you said, um, I'm Manuel, and I'm now a PhD student at the University of Stuttgart in Germany. And my main topic is um, studying uh, indigenous languages of, of the American continent. Um, I'm also from um, a tribe in Mexico. It's, uh, it's called Virrarica. So yeah, this is my main interest. And what, what my, my main aim is to get like all those technologies that, that we have today for English, that we can also have it uh, for our languages. So um, I'm uh, this talk will be a little bit focused on the polysynthetic languages, uh, but of course we, I will also try to get uh, more languages into the scope of the research. Um, so uh, the main idea, um, I will try to well, first give a little bit uh, of an overview on what is going on uh, in NLP for indigenous languages in general, what challenges we have, and then um, I will also talk a little bit about the research I have been doing for to try to um, to give some cont contributions to our community. And so, yeah, so in any moment you have some kind of uh, ideas or you, you can uh, feel free to interrupt me without problems. <laughs> so, um, well, first, um, when we talk about indigenous languages in Americas, um, we need to know that we have a wide range of linguistic families. So that means that um, if we think about, for example, the Indo-European linguistic family, we can imagine this, a very diverse um, a, a spectrum of languages, for example, English, but also Hindi is inside those languages. That means that uh, Russian too, so that means that, that, that uh, if, when we talk about a linguistic family, we have a really wide range of 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 and richness of languages. But the problem is that in the in our continent, um, we have so many different linguistic families that that, that we can really get uh, a really huge richness, but also that means that it is very difficult to try to apply one single model or some some models for all of them. And that, that and we have to be aware if we study it. Uh, yeah. Then um, we have also the issue that, or advantage, it depends <laughs> uh, how we can look at it, that, um, that there is a wide range of linguistic uh, phenomena going on. So that means that we, it's not only one kind of, um, like, let, let, let's say, uh, a rich morphology, but we have not only that phenomena. So um, this is a big challenge if we study NLP for, for all, of, all of our languages. Um, we have two main with, um, phenomena that we have to deal with, or at least that is what we have found. The first one are um, tonal languages, and they are very common in the southern part of Mexico. Um, and the, the main idea is that we add information to a certain uh, uh, word, but changing the tone of that word. Um, we, we see here an example of, for example, the Otomi, uh, Otomi language, and also one example of the Mistec language. Of, co um, of course, that is um, not, I mean, that can be even more challenging. There is another language called Chatino, and that language um, has about uh, 12 or more, more than 10 tones. And um, so all this information is compressed into the, the, the tonal aspect of, 
of a of a word, and um, giving the case that even the native speakers can communicate between them if they um, like only changing tones without even spelling them, I mean, uh, pr pronouncing the uh, the word. Um, so, of course, we have also a very high com and, and complex morphology. So, if we look uh, to understand that, um, let's have a look at, at, at English. For example, we have the word "sleeping" in English, and it can divide it. It can be divided into two different morphemes: the sleep and ing. Um, so, each of those parts can be understood separately. For example, we can understand understand what is the meaning of sleep and what is the meaning of ing in English. Therefore, um, in the digital languages, um, I mean, the um, uh, the um, um, sorry, <laughs> morpheme is a is the smallest part of a length of, of a of a word that still have a meaning has a meaning. If we look at the German example, we can see that they can create very very large words, and that can be divided into again different morphemes. In that case, for example, in this case, it's telecommunications things like those and each of those parts has still a meaning. Um, and that is a common sense, what is a complex morphology, at least for uh, uh, speakers that only know about Indo-European languages. But if, let's uh, have an example of uh, Birrarica. Birrarica is an indigenous language of, of, of Mexico. It's from the Uto aztec family. And if we divide that uh, into, into the morphemes, you see that we really have um, um, a very... Um, a very difficult task to, to to handle. If we translate it, it can be translated as don't bother me when I eat. Mm, great. So, um, what else do we have and what other challenges do we have for indigenous languages? First, we, ha we have a lack of orthographic normalization. That means that everyone writes uh, as, uh, as they want. And if we try to apply any kind of program to try to to process that, we have to kind of normalize that orthography. And it is difficult because there is no main varieties or there we have no um, common use standardization. Only in a few languages it is available, but uh, in most languages it is not the case. Then um, even inside a single um, language, we have a, a huge variety of, of, of dialects. That means that even the language spoken in one village can't be understood in another language village, and that can be also a, a huge a huge problem. One, one classical example is Mistec, where um, in, it's considered a single language, but indeed the, uh, the, the differentiation and the, of that language can be so huge that even in, um, it can be divided like uh, in all of 30 languages inside, inside the main language. So this is the, the state of that part. And um, yeah, and we have a limited di digital text production, so maybe communities that have like 50,000 speakers, um, they they usually speak it in, in daily life, but they don't use it in the internet and when they interact on Facebook, uh, Twitter, or, or any other social network. And that is a problem because we have not enough resources to handle that. And, and most of the time it is because um, simply they don't know how to write it. So that is very difficult for NLP. And um, so let's have a, a quick overview on what is going on. We, ha we have 140 linguistic families in the world, and 40% of those languages are in America continent. Um, so, and we still have uh, 900, about 900 indigenous languages that are, uh, are being spoken in different uh, levels, and some of them are, them are really endangered others are really, really dynamic. Um, many of them have uh, has more than one million of uh, speakers, and others have maybe ten left, or, or even less. So the the, different, the the challenges are different for all for for all of those languages. But we still have to do something on that. Um, so we have also the problem that, that uh, nowadays. We have a lot of more. Uh, all the state-of-the-art models require a, a vast amount of corpora. Um, 
um, mainly the neural models um, and even the statistical ones need an uh, important amount of data and we don't have it. On the other side, um, mm, yeah, so we don't have the resources uh, in like in, in corpora or as uh, data sets. So it is difficult to find the content in indigenous languages that we can like uh, train models or use it for um, for NLP. But we still have some resources, and that is important. First, we have parallel core in corpora. Then we have dictionaries, we have speech collections, we have data sets on morphology, and we have also a little bit more complex and annotated data, for example, tree banks and post tagging sets. Um, of course, uh, there is also a problem that maybe in, in so, at some point one of those are annotated on, on one orthographic rules or another, on different dialects. And um, the, the, the huge, the most important problem is that we don't have a single place where we can get all the data sets that are available today. So let's talk about what is approximately what we have in, in parallel core corpora. Um, there are data sets that are about 18,000 phrases, parallel phrases. There is one, um, uh, one exception that, 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 that is Inuit. It has um, like 2,000 K phrases, but in the most of the, of, of the languages, we don't have that. Then we have dictionaries that are like 3.5K uh, words. Then also speech that are mostly about uh, 10 hours of annotated spe speech for each language. Um, morphology, we have about 2,000 uh, roots annotated, uh, more or less, uh, on those data. And yeah, uh, so when the tree banks and the post tagings are really small data sets. Um, if you are familiar familiar with that, we have not enough data for, for all of that. But uh, we have still good news. The, the total amount of research papers that, that came out in the last years are um, is increasing dramatically, and it seems that in the last three years we are getting a lot of interest in the field. And that is also because we have uh, new data sets, we have uh, people that, that are more aware, and also um, members of indigenous communities that are really willing to participate uh, in, in the research. So that is a good thing if we classify that in, in the different tasks that we have in, in NLP. We can see that morphology is always present, but we have also a machine translation tests, but also, uh, well, we have uh, work on data sets that is very important. And the interesting part is that um, we have also, we're also try expanding, but not only staying with morphology and machine translation, what are the, what are the classical tasks for indigenous languages, but also we are uh, increasing the number of, of challenges. If we look at what languages are have study uh, or have papers and research going on. They are in yellow, but but um, we still have a lot of languages that has have no uh, research at all going on, and that is that is really sad. And the invitation to all that are listening today is that if you want to contribute to this with your own language, that would be really great. So um, let's talk about um, polysynthetic languages. So first, um, let, let us define what a polysynthetic language is. Um, uh, it is very important that, that uh, there are three main characteristics of polysynthetic languages. That is head market morphology. That means that, uh, where the verb has a, has a preference position. That, uh, I don't know if, um, if you all can speak um, one language, but it seems that when, it means that mostly in North, in North America, we have a lot of um, of polysynthetic languages, and we have a lot of uh, polysynthetic languages. And um, okay, sorry, I got interrupted. <laughs> um, okay, so we have a lot of polysynthetic languages, and um, most part of of um, of the more of the information is encrypted into the verb. That means that we have a lot of information uh, classified into, I mean, um, compressed into the verb and not so much complex parts on other parts of the sentence. And that is definitely interesting. On the other side, um, we have, um, uh -huh. we, 
always need to have an agreement between the verb and, and, and the other parts, for example, the object or, or a noun. And that means that we need to have um, uh, a morpheme, a morpheme that, that, that agrees with the structure, the general structure of, 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 of the sentence. And we can have also the, the possibility of, of incorporate nouns into uh, nouns into uh, the verb. And that is definitely no, there is no other example of other kind of languages that can do it. Uh, and of course, that means that we have also a huge fragmentation of um, a huge fra fra fragmentation of the verbs, and that will lead us to a. Mm, sorry, I will change a place. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and yeah, and that will mean that we have a lot of morphemes in 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 a word. Okay, so. Um, how do we handle that in machine translation, for example? And only to, to, to spend a few words on that. Um, if, if we take into account, for example, all the Uto Aztec family, or um, the Inukut uh, linguistic family, or, and I mean, most all languages in North America are polysynthetic, and that is very interesting for us. Okay. Um, so, um, what has been done for machine translation? First, we have a lot of, of rule-based MT systems, and they're very popular for low resource languages because we don't need to have data. But the problem is that we re that it is that uh, ling high linguistic knowledge is required. That is not always the case, um, and, th and that is definitely a problem. Uh, and of course, it, was, it will be only for one single language pair, and the systems are really complex, so that is not completely easy to, to get. Um, on the other hand, we had uh, also some research done on statistical machine translation systems, and the advantage is that they can actually use a small parallel corpora, but the problem is that, that we still can't get all the advantages of neural machine translation that are state-of-the-art models to, to pay. And, um, we also have some examples of NMT systems, but due to them, the really low am amount of, of, of resources, it is very difficult to get it work. And we have not, not achieved good results for NMT systems for indigenous languages. Um, something very important here is that uh, what, what we normally do for that is um, training support level models for uh, machine learning. For example, um, uh, we can use character-based models, more more theme-based models, or even by uh, parent codings for handle the the high mor morphological richness of, of our languages. Um, so yeah. So uh, let's see an uh, example of the challenge of doing machine translation for those languages. And that is, uh, for example, if we have um, a Spanish English alignment. Then we can simply align este pájaro cantó varias veces with that bird sang several times, and in many cases, most of the time, the alignments are one to one. And let's see now an example of a Spanish with radical alignment. Mm. And as you see, we have here uh, a large word that is, uh, for example, muku, bikim, but putio cabicarro, it's not that easy to align because uh, we have three words in English and in Spanish to align it to one single word in, in, in Vir Radica. If we, do the, if, if we do the segmentation and we try to look into the word on the, on the, on the morpheme level, then we will see that uh, the alignments are easier. However, there are still some parts that are not, not completely aligned, as you can see here. So there are some morphemes that, that, that are never aligned to uh, Spanish or English trans and translation because they are completely uh, particular of the um, of the language. For example, "pu" is a is a verbalizer, and the morpheme "u" means that the action that is going on is part uh, is in the context of the speaker. So, um, if if we say here the um, the bird has uh, sung several times, that is a translation to English, then 
that means that this, this bird is singing here, in this place. But if we do a translation to Spanish or English, that will never be encoded. So this is a, this is a difficult task to try to reconstruct. For example, if you want to do the translation from Spanish to uh, Virradica, it is kind of impossible if we all, uh, to know what is if we should use you or another morpheme to do this classification. Um, if we do the alignments um, between Spanish and several uh, indigenous languages uh, that has the polysynthetic um, that are polysynthetic, then we will see that the more complex the more langu the languages that are more complex has. Um, um, has always more morphemes that are not aligned to the Spanish. But if we see it, if we hear, for example, Nahuatl, it's definitely um, it's um, much easier to align and to translate into Spanish than Birrarica, that that uh, sixty percent of the tokens are not aligned in that case, and in Nahuatl only forty-four. And if we see always the direction that where we are translating from one's polysynthetic language to uh, to Spanish, we will see that it's always much easier. For example, here we have only 35%, uh, 27% uh, and 26% of morphemes that are not aligned. That means that it is much easier. OK, so um, there are, of course, a lot of things that, that we can do. Um, First place, we can improve the morphological segmentation because it has been proved that if we have a good morphological segmentation uh, segmenter, then we can also do a better job in machine translation. But of course, that is not the only way of doing it, and um, we, there are still a lot of uh, things to to try out. So now let's talk about morphology. Um, what has been on a morphology? We had lemmatization and steaming as a classical task in morphology and NLP. But the problem is that if we only try to get a lemma of a word, then we will lose all the other information that is, there, that is encoded into the verb. And that is a problem. And that is not that easy as we do it in, in English. Um, OK, but, but on the other hand, uh, if we only remove the suffixes, then we will not have, uh, then we have also the problem of the prefixes that many of our languages had only prefixes or only suffixes or both. So that is not uh, completely easy to, to perform. Um, then we have uh, another kind of morphological tools, for example, morphological analyzers, uh, seg segmenters, and uh, tools that do inflection and reinflection. That means that um, we have to go deeper into morphology in the case of um, um, of our languages. And we can't simply do it like we do it in, in, in English to reduce sparsity. Um, OK, so but what has been done? First, there, we have also rule-based for the morphological tasks. Um, we have a lot of tools that are unsupervised or semi-supervised that, that has got decent performance. But definitely, it's not enough. Um, then um, we'll speak about that. Uh, we developed a neural uh, system for low resources that uh, can perform the task of, the se of, of, of segmentation, but there are also t uh, other experiments that are on inflection or array inflection and even on, um, on, an, on morphological an uh, analysis. There is a good thing that is going on. This is the Connell Sigmorph and Share task, and they include uh, three languages of our continent in their data set, and that is a big advantage for us. <laughs> OK, so uh, let, let's talk about them. Um, um, OK, so we have, again, here the, the task of surface segmentation. Um, on one hand, again, let's, let's remember we have uh, one word, and we try to cut exactly the part where the morpheme, uh, where we can have a boundary in the morpheme. So uh, the definition, the formal definition of a morpheme is that it's the smallest meaning bearing unit in a word. Um, we have a, we publish a data set on three uh, North American la languages, that is Mexicanero, Nahuatl, Virrarica, and Joram Noki. And, and basically, the data sets are very small, but still enough to, to perform uh, uh, statistical 
significant analysis on them and, and do some experiment, uh, meaningful experimentation. Um, if we look to the uh, segments per word rate, it's also very interesting. For example, in Viradica we have and that 80% of all the words are uh, have segmentations that we have in our data set. And for example, if we look to the languages that are not so rich, uh, there are, for example, Mexicanero and Nahuatl have only say, around 60%. Then, of course, um, with also the, the morpheme per word rate, that means that um, how many morphemes we have in average, and the radical again wins with 3.25 uh, um, uh, more, uh, more more themes per word this is really high. Okay, um, let's talk about a little bit about the languages. Here is Nahuatl. This is a very it's a, a language that is spoken by about uh, two million people. Mexicanero is a small. Com uh, it's only spoken in two communities in Mexico. It's uh, we have here about uh, ten thousand speakers or even less. We have Miradica, spoken by 50,000 people. It's in the same kind of in the same region, and Yolimnok is in the northern part. And uh, yeah, it's spoken by about uh, 100,000 uh, speakers. All of those languages belongs to the Uto Aztec linguistic family. So, um, what have we done? Uh, so we, 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 we use the sequence, sequence model, where in the input we use character uh, embeddings. Those character words, uh, embeddings are feeded into encoder decoder GRU model. Then we we also have a tension mechanism that that helps to calculate the in the, the, the decoder probabilities that are that is also a GRU, and then we, we perform a softmax to get the output uh, the the characters again in the output. So the main idea that we have here, uh, please tell me if I go to to much into the details we can speak I can skip details that are not needed it's fine sorry yeah go. okay yeah sorry <laughs> yeah uh, please uh, simply tell me if I go too too much in the details so the, the problem is that we have um, low resources here and the sequence to sequence models really need a lot of resource uh, of, 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 of data so um, the main idea here is to uh, of data augmentation is to use unlabeled data and use the additional examples to train it correctly. We did uh, two experiments here. First one is uh, the, an, an autoencoding task, that is simply copying the input to the output. Um, but the problem is that if we do like that, then we also will teach the model not to segment. On the other, um, so we also add random characters that are generated, like uh, in the example, and it's copied in the output, expecting that we can train how to not segment, but also how to copy the input into the output. So, okay, this the second idea is to train it as a multitask. So we have again the unlabeled data, but in that case, we are specifying with a with a special embedding. The task, in that case, the, um, the autoencoding task, with an AI and the random example, and the random example also, right? So that means that now we have a, um, we have two different tasks. The first one is to copy, and the second one is to segment. And this is important because the model learns to to do it like that, and then we optimize on on the joint probability of them. Um, and we also tried a cross-lingual transfer experiment. That means that we train all the languages together in one single huge model. And we're, and we're hoping that we can transfer uh, info, um, knowledge from one model, from our one language, from one to the other. And then we have the optimization in the following way here. Um, great. So what about the results here? <laughs> um, let Let's check what is going on uh, first. In the first place, we saw that the data augmentation of the unlabeled data hearts the model. Then, um, but we found out that random strings are always helping, even in the fashion of data augmentation or in multitask training. Also, we saw that we can outperform non-neural systems like the CRF system, that is our strong baseline here, uh, with the only uh, difference in Nahuatl where the CRF model performed much better than any neural system. But uh, 
It's also true that for more complex languages like Yoemnoki and Viradika, neural systems perform better than, uh, than the non-neural systems. Okay, so if you want to, uh, to have a look at other solutions that came out in this year, there is a very interesting work uh, of a Russian colleague, colleague and uh, he used convolutional neural networks to do with, with the same problem and used this data set. And also there is another uh, approach that used uh, un unsupervised techniques to try to get a uh, good performance and it performed, performed really well. So he, if you want to try out the data set, uh, the link is below. I can also share later the, um, the slides. Okay, then um, we also looked at what is actually going on on uh, for indigenous languages in the internet, and we found that uh, we uh, we as uh, the native speakers use a lot of code switching because there are may maybe some concepts that are not usually uh, usual for our languages, and um, then we perform another study on for that. So first, what is code switching? So that means that we mix languages in one single phrase. For example, we have this example, Spanish English is muy awesome. And if we try to, to find uh, what languages are involved in that case, we have uh, Spanish English can be kind of considered English, then this is English, muy is Spanish, also English, and we have also tag for, for other um, symbols or special symbols. So um, as you can see here, um, uh, the main task here is to try to identify in which language is each word uh, written. We have different kind of code switching. So we have sentence code switching, a level code switching. That means that we use one, sen one sentence in one language and then we switch in the next sentence to another language. We have um, different uh, words from different languages that are mixed into one single um, sentence. And then we also have uh, combination of morphemes that are mixed from different languages in one single word. And as the languages in, in the American continent have a lot of morphological richness, it is very common that, that such a, a, a um, phenomenon occurs. So, so we decided to study more into the intra-word code switching. And let's see the example. Here we have again uh, the Viradika language. So we have Puti Uta Kvika Ru. And this, um, this word can be um, substituted. Yeah. We can incorporate an English word into it, and now it, is com it sounds completely fine, but it is called switched. So this kind of, of, of cases occur quite often. Yeah. And so let's explore exactly what we are suggesting to do. Um, we have here a token-based uh, language identification task where we only identify that word as a mixed word. But in our case, we wanted to go into the morphology so we can split and find out in what parts each word should be split and what language is each, each part of the word. So in that example, we have Neiva, that is the Radica, Pe, that is, that, that is the Radica, Cansado, it's Spanish, and Ru, it's again the, the Radica. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the task we are trying to solve here. So um, we have our data set that is Spanish with Radica. We extracted it from about 1,000 uh, comments on Facebook and public comments on Facebook. Um, it contains about 8,000 tokens and 3.13% are mixed. So as you can see in the last slide, a lot of information is compressed into such kind of words. So it means that even if it's only 3.13%, a lot of information is actually inside those words. Then we also uh, need to know that about 17% uh, of all sentences that we collected has those uh, such kind of words. That means that they're very important and we cannot simply say that they are mixed, but we have to go into, into it. We tried out different models. First one, um, well, first we tried out a character based LS, uh, by LSTM. Uh, after that, we tried out a pipeline approach. That means that we have we first tag each um, each uh, character. After that, we do we are 
um, with a PyLSTM or conditional random with a PyLSTM or a, uh, or a conditional random field, and then we split again uh, the words so we can get out the tags in, of the I mean the boundaries. Um, we will present the results on, on all of them, and then we also used a segmental recurrent neural network. That is a, a an architecture that is not so common seen, but it performed really well in our task. So first, um, what is the segmental RNN that is not so common? Um, it's based on a semi-Markov conditional random field. It was proposed by Kong et al. in 2016. And basically, it's a bidirectional RNN. In our case, we use, a, we use the LSTM. There is a kind of RNN. And, um, and, and we embed all the, the futures with that. And then we input it into um, into a, a semi-CRF uh, fashion model that, that can get the joint probability of segmenting and labeling each part. So um, basically, this is the way we do it. If, if you can see that this is a, a joint model of finding the segments and the boundaries given an input sequence of, of, of characters. <sighs> OK, um, uh, just to go. Uh, Mm, very quick treat. We have two RNNs. One goes from the beginning to the end, and the second one goes uh, from the end to the beginning of the word. Um, so uh, the outputs of, of, of both of them, we feed it into, we, we, uh, sorry, we concatenate it with the GY and GZ that are functions that, that, map, that maps the labels, candidates, and, this, and the segmentation duration that is set. And then this vector um, is, is concatenated and is parameterized by a function uh, B and a nonlinear activation function A. So as you can see in the in the formula. Mm. Okay, what we found is the segmentation RNN works better for mixed words in general. Um, surprisingly, the pipeline approaches were not that bad. So they, they actually had a really uh, comparable result. And the character-based by LSTM got definitely not good results. Here we have some examples. We also did the experiment on Turkish to find out that there was some uh, kind of difference. And Virradica, uh, the, the combination of Virradica and Spanish in the, in the code, switch, in the code switching uh, proved that it was um, the um, RNN models performed much better rather than for uh, Turkish German. And if we go to the to the to the uh, we, we perform two, two uh, metrics, one of, of how well it, it, those models do the segmentation, and it is they are very really comparable on those results. But on the side of the tagging, we found out that uh, the segmentation the segmental RNN performed much better for a complex more, uh, language uh, like Virarica. Oh, we, we also have here the F1 score, the other one the accuracy ones. So if you want to get through it, uh, you can read the paper for more details. Um, so, and let's talk about some conclusions and some future work we're doing now. Um, first, um, we noticed that the North American languages are the most studied ones. That is very important. So we have much more language speakers in the South, but in North America we, we, are, we have much more studies. That means Mexico, U uh, the US, and, and Canada. Then we have uh, NLP research for the America, for American indigenous languages um, that will give not only more understanding about our own languages, but also for the language, for the understanding of the human languages in general. It will, of course, have a positive impact, a social impact for all the speakers if we get better tools uh, for our languages, and that will also encourage people to continue speaking or even to learn those languages. And uh, we really hope to get more data sets, uh, share tasks, and workshops to improve performance of our systems on that. So um, we're also collecting uh, um, uh, all the papers that, that we find in the internet, and we're trying to make a list. So this is a GitHub account where you can, where we have stored the list, and you definitely can add or uh, or suggest any paper that you know or any software that is out, so we can collect it. It all in, in one single place. So um, special thanks to Katrina Khan that is uh, that has been working with, with me a lot. Uh, she is now a professor at the University of Boulder. So thank you very much. 
And thank you very much, all of you. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Um, I don't know if I'm on time, but uh, okay, we have time. So, and some references. Okay, yeah, finished. So, I don't know. Do you have any questions, suggestions? Yeah, I have. I have a question. Um, and I think uh, Nick joined in case there's any questions on the live stream. Um, I think my question was, what funding models, um, I, I guess I'm curious like where you get funding or like, because there's probably, I imagine there's a lot of different programs out there for this type of research. So I'm curious, is it strictly like, um, Sorry, um, I, 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 I couldn't got the, the question. Can you repeat it? Yeah, I guess I'm just curious, like, uh, where do you seek funding to support your research? Oh, sorry. Uh, it's a lot of noise here. Can you write it maybe? Because, <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Uh, oh, um, I have here a question. I can answer that first and maybe uh, if you can write it uh, after that. Okay, oh, it, you, there is a question about uh, the test train split. Mm, okay, great. Okay, um, I haven't, I, I, we did any human evaluation on, the, on, on, on our results. Um, so, um, and the split, okay, we can go back. Let me check that out. Uh, let me see if I have it. Okay, I have now. Oh, I think I have not included it. Uh, how I did the split of the data set? Um, no, sorry. So basically, we had about uh, 600 example uh, training instances for the morphological um, for the morphological segmentation task, and about 200 uh, for testing and 100 for. Uh, uh, for development set, um, on the um, in the uh, case of the co of the code switching, we did a fivefold uh, validation, and uh, the split were about uh, six hundred instances for uh, for training again, and one hundred for development, and the rest like two hundred for um, for testing. So yeah. This is what 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 we did. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, you asked about um, uh, found, uh, founding, like for money. <laughs> um, uh, well, um, I have no, we have no foundings now. Uh, uh, we did it mostly about uh, using our time uh, as kind of free. Before I joined to them. <laughs> to my PhD now, the PhD I get it from the DAD, that is uh, the, the grant I got, but yeah, <laughs> and it would be always great to have like funds to get annotators and get uh, resources and other stuff. Mm, yeah, so I hope I, that that was okay for the answers. Um, if you have more questions. <laughs> Um, can you hear me? Okay, that is an interesting question. <laughs> um, um, okay, that that is more linguistical thing. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the languages are more specialized in some aspects of them. Um, yeah, so there is, there is, the languages are a little bit more specialized on certain aspects of daily life. For example, uh, in most languages we saw that we have a lot of words for natural stuff, but of course there is a lacking of uh, particular morphemes for technology or, or modern life uh, thing, but uh, as, as we have 
Uh, I mean, as the languages have a very flexible way of constructing words, it should be not that difficult. So that is a cool thing. But yeah, so what else? Um, Um, or do you need to get um, Facebook comments and other comments in the public? Um, the interesting thing about Facebook is that um, well, we avoided to use the API of Facebook to collect uh, the, um, the messages because we don't want to deal with the problem of privacy. I mean, if, we, if you have a private uh, account with an uh, API, I would also collect that, so we want to avoid it, and only collect it on 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 information that it is completely public to everyone. And therefore, we, we locked out about, uh, of Facebook and we manually collected all the uh, examples. So that took a little bit of time. But um, yeah, this, this is a problem when, when we collect the, and gather the, the Facebook comments. Of course, if you want to donate your, your conversation, that, that would be really cool. Um, then we have a comment for, from Nick. Salar, uh, great to hear that you you are getting such high F1 scores uh, with relative small data set. I am a I'm, um, machine learning engineer working in my free time on Locono. Oh, that is great. And to a lesser degree, you get it my end. Oh, really great. And the data sets are sometimes painful small. But your work is, oh, thank you very much. Yeah, th th there's always the big problem. The, the good thing is that uh, when we work on morphology, then we actually are working on a much smaller space. And um, so morphology is a little bit easier for uh, working with lower fast languages, but the problem is when we go like to the machine translation task, then it definitely not, do not perform that well. So yeah, there's a lot of things to do and definitely we should uh, talk later about uh, the work we, we, are, we are doing. Okay, first one, um, we definitely, uh, what do you suggest communities in order to increase the data sets? First, uh, we definitely should uh, uh, talk more in, uh, on social networks on, uh, with our own language. I think that is definitely, that would definitely be, be cool. There are a lot, of, uh, for example, in the radical language that is the one spoken for, uh, of my, from, the, from my family of my father, I'm sadly not a speaker, a native speaker, but they even have means uh, using their own language. So we definitely sh uh, a definitely good way of doing activism and trying to put um, languages onto the scope uh, is using them on, on internet. So, yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, of course, I, I can share it with you. I mean, we have a lot there. <laughs> and I find, I have, I have seen that a lot, uh, uh, more communities are getting into it because uh, I mean that is a fun thing, and we really need to make it uh, our own language is cool for for that and up to date in in the environment as internet. Because if we don't do it, then uh, we'll maybe the native speakers will switch into uh, a language like English or Spanish or whatever, and that is not uh, that is I think that is not in the interest of our communities. Yeah, sure, I will pass it um, in Slack. Um, okay, anything else? Or oh, are we ready? Are we um, done? Yeah, I think, I think we're nearing the end. Um, thank you again uh, for your presentation. Um, thank you. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, you can stay in the, in the chat here. Um, I'm going yeah. to pause the, the live stream so that we can help uh, Valerie mm -hmm. get set up for the, the next presentation. Okay, great. Uh, you, Thank you. you. Yeah, uh, sadly, I think I have to move now to, to take the, to find another connection to the train, but okay. I will join later. Okay. Right. Then uh, see you. And sorry for the for the bad uh, connection audio I had here. It's okay. Thank, okay. Thank you. See you. Bye.